Hi, everybody. Michael Oss from the Cedar Rapids Gazette with Nathan Ford, who also edits this thing for consumption. Iowa men's basketball is our subject material. Buckeyes had a nice week. You called pretty good. It. You called pretty, it. pretty good. I yes. did, yes. You said a sweep. Made up for my uh, my terrible Super Bowl bets, but uh, yeah, it was it was about as good of week as you could hope for. Double digit, both double digit wins, and then the Michigan State game. Just you know, I it, it, I know it's not the same Michigan State that it is every year, but if you know Iowa fans have seen games go the exact opposite way there plenty of times, so that had to have been cathartic. Well, I made the mistake of taking Michigan State in 29 and a half points. So I got. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was the. I mean, yeah, I mean, Michigan State's not good this year. It's no secret. There's no getting around it. I watched their game against Purdue last night, and it was, it just seemed like, I mean, they hung and hung and hung with Purdue, but it just seemed like you knew that in the last few minutes they were going to find a way to lose. And, they did. They just don't have guards. No, and the, they they don't have shooting. They don't have, and, and uh, you know, year after year, we talk about Michigan State being built on defense, rebounding, toughness, but you you have to score too, and they just don't have that that those weapons that they typically do. And and I think part of it is just sort of the disruptions they've had, and a lot of the blue blood blue bloods that are relying on some new faces are struggling this year, but Michigan state just has not put it together. And even in a normal year, I'm not sure they would. They're just not quite as talented as, as a typical Michigan state team. Yeah. Well, that said, it was still, I mean, it was a demolition. It wasn't going on the road and, you know, fine, you know, pulling away in the last five minutes or it wasn't, there was no sweat lost in this game. I mean, it was domination from very early on. Yeah, and that's obviously when Michigan State came to Iowa, it was an 84-78 game that, like we were talking about, almost felt like a loss in some ways because you just wanted to see Iowa put it all together and really put away a team that is sort of in the middle to the bottom of the pack in the Big Ten. And that's what we saw on Saturday and from the start, really just clicking on all cylinders, except for the best player on the team didn't have his best day. And, and to be able to beat a team by 30 points, any big 10 team by 30 points when Luca Garza scores eight is, Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that says it all that it was, it was an incredible performance. Well, uh, Michigan state's defense was, you know, swamp Garza. Iowa makes like eight out of its, I think eight of its first 13 threes. That screws up your Swamp Garza defense. I mean, if Iowa just shoots something semi-close to eight out of its first 13, that's going to, that'll take care of business every single time. You had Connor McCaffrey and Keegan Murray knocking down threes. And when that's happening, the other team doesn't have much of a chance. I mean, right. I mean, you can't expect this on a game by game basis, but it's it's what Iowa, Iowa did what it has to do. The defenses have been ganging up on guards as, as much as they've ever been these last few games. His numbers have reflected it, but in the last two games, it hasn't hurt Iowa a bit because other people are standing up. Right, and we talked about the absence of CJ Frederick having such an impact on, on the way the offense plays because defenses are going to surround Garza and to not have that extra three point weapon out there has really hurt Iowa in some of these games. But on Saturday, we did see other guys step up and be able to knock down shots. Like you said, McCaffrey, Murray, and then obviously Wieskamp was outstanding and we'll get into that too. But I think, I think Connor McCaffrey is, a plenty capable three point shooter. It's just, I mean, if you look at it in high school, he shot, I think he shot better than 40% his senior year. And obviously it's a different animal in division one basketball, but he's able to knock down shots when he's open. It's just that he's a pass first guy. And if he's guarded, he's probably, 
it, it, it's not like he can get make, create his own shot from three like some of the other Iowa guards can. So I think him having the game he did that that's encouraging going forward. If if you're if you're still going to be either without Frederick or he's still going to be limited because that that opens things up a lot a lot more if you can have those other guys knocking down shots and free and freeing up Wies Camp and Bohannon even more. The thing with Connor McCaffrey that strikes me is his three point statistics haven't been particularly great in college. Uh, and there's been a lot of time this season when he's not going to take the shots because he's surrounded with three point shooters. I mean, when Frederick's playing, the other four guys, the other four starters are, are good three point shooters. So he's going to kind of bet back off about, uh, on those when, when teams are sagging off him. And he did that when they played Michigan State and Iowa City. But it isn't from lack of confidence. It doesn't matter what his percentages are. It doesn't want to matter what people think his shooting form is like. And it certainly isn't textbook. It's not Wieskamp. It's not Bohannon. But he is not hesitant at all to shoot the shot because it's it's not how they go up it's how they go in and you're right that in high school I saw him play in high school yeah the shot doesn't look conventional but he doesn't care he shoots the way he feels comfortable shooting the ball and it works for him and if he can just you know be regarded as a threat from this point forward with or without Frederick, that kind of changes the complexion of things for defenses. It really does. And, you know, defenses sag, sag off him. But like you said, he's, he, he can hit the shot. So they're going to have to, they're going to have to guard him. It, for me, when his struggling percentages isn't so much because, you know, defensives, defenses leave him open and he takes bad shots. It's just because, like you said, there's, other weapons and he's such a good passer that he's going to look for those guys first. If he knows coming in that he has to be a threat, then I'm, he's not going to be hunting his shot or anything like that, but he's going to be looking at the basket and, and instead of just looking to pass always. And, and that's going to be big for Iowa if he can consistently hit that shot. Well, with the way wieskamp has been shooting. And then if you have to worry about McCaffrey and Murray, Garza is going to start getting his points again. It just has to work that way. <laughs> Otherwise, teams are, I mean, okay. A, a team, Izzo called it picking his poison. Uh, then there's, they're not going to come out hitting eight of their first 13 every game. But if these other four guys are peppering away, you got to do something at some point. You know, you've got to switch it up and – Garz is not going to have another eight point game. No. And, and three points are worth more than two. So if I was going to be <laughs> making threes, you, you're going to be like, okay, maybe we look just like Garza and take our chances here. But and I, I even thought Garza had some pretty good looks on Saturday. Mm -hmm. They just didn't go down and he just really never seemed in a rhythm. And of course they, it, it's not like he had to take control of the game kind of like he did against, on the road against Indiana in the second half. So I think he was, he was okay. Just kind of taking a back seat in that game, but yeah, you're right. There's no way he's going to be, he's going to be limited to that. Well, in the, in the first half back to back possessions, uh, he hits a cutting McCaffrey for a layup and then he swings it back out to McCaffrey for a three in two straight quick possessions. Iowa gets five points Garza to McCaffrey instead of the other way around. And even Connor had to laugh about that afterwards. He said he didn't think in the scouting report it was uh, Garza's going to drop some dimes to McCaffrey. Maybe we'll start here. I know you probably don't watch as many. Yeah, I mean, obviously you don't watch as many games on TV, but maybe we'll start hearing the announcers rave about Luca Garza's post-entry passing because every usually every game it's, I think Connor McCaffrey is one of the best post-entry passers in the country. Right. Maybe it'll be Garza's turn to, to show some of that off now. Um, Iowa needed a sweep last week. And when I say last week, I mean the Rutgers, Michigan State games. Indiana technically started the week. Uh, 
for psychological reasons, of course. I mean, it, it just to feel good about playing well and winning, it's the most easy thing to explain. But practically speaking, uh, it, it feels like the cement to me is still wet, but, but the Hawkeyes are getting closer to solidifying their place as a top four NCAA seed with, to me, a, a very real chance of getting a three and maybe even a two with the games remaining. Um, the NCAA put them on the four line in their first rankings Saturday morning, I think it was, the, the highest seeded four team. And it's still a ways before we have to worry about where they do end up. But I'd so much rather be a three than a four. You know, Absolutely. if you're a four, you, you're set to play a five in the second round. So that's fraught with peril. And then, of course, if you get out of that and get to the Sweet 16, you're looking at a number one in the Sweet 16. Uh, that's not what you want, you know? So uh, what do you think they got to do to be classified as higher than a four when, when you know, Selection Sunday comes? Well, and particularly this year, too, you don't want to be in that, that four spot where – the one seeds, there's a chance you're going to get in with some of the best teams we've seen in college basketball over the last couple decades. So this year in particular, you want to get in that three spot, but they're going to have opportunities for quality wins. And I think mm -hmm. it's about, it, it's hard to say what the committee is going to, going to value more, but they, they do the good, the good thing for Iowa is that it's not going to have bad losses and it's going to have a chance to get a lot of quad one wins piled up here. Just looking at, at the big 10, I, you know, I don't think it's going to matter if Iowa is like a eight to nine loss team. And it's getting compared against maybe like a Houston. That's like a two to three loss team because Iowa could have a chance to have somewhere in the range of like 10 quad one wins almost mm -hmm. and, and the big 10 tournament too. It's, it's almost like the pressure is kind of, and I, I don't think the players really think of it this way, but just from that perspective, the pressure of like the big 10 title is sort of off the table because Michigan is, and, and even Ohio state is kind of pulled away a little bit. And so now you're just kind of like, there's nothing to lose kind of, you I mean, you're safely in the tournament. You've got chances to beat some quality teams and just work your way up. And yeah, if they can beat two or three of these teams and sort of, and not get blown out against anybody, which they haven't so far, I think I think they're just going to keep working their way back up. I mean, you look at some of the numbers; like, they're still number they're still ranked number four in the country on Kempom, and that, yeah. that's not a that's not a four seed. Just looking at it, they're going to have probably the best or one of the best offensive efficiencies in the country. At some point, with no bad losses and those numbers, I think the committee looks at is probably going to look at that at towards the end of the season and say that's a really good team. Here's the one stat that I sort of find curious from Iowa's point of view is they, they don't have a win over a team that's currently ranked. Uh, the opportunity to change that, as you alluded to, they have four opportunities like that. They play Wisconsin twice. They go to Ohio State and Michigan. And then there's the Big Ten tournament. So, I mean, they're seventh in today's NCAA NET ranking, which the committee uses. It doesn't rely exclusively on it, but it does use it. Uh, there's, there are some baked in good things for Iowa that it can only add to unless, you know, it just falls apart. Right. And I think, you know, with those net, the net rankings, they, they do look at, you know, how, where you rank in that, but more importantly is like the teams you beat in there. And, and it is kind of a strange situation that they, they haven't beaten anybody that's, that's currently ranked because they've beaten some quality teams. And if you look, I think in quad one right now, they're, they're four and five and they're four and one in quad two. So mm -hmm. they're, they, it's like, if you look at it that way, you're like, that's, that's pretty good. You got eight quad one, quad two wins, but 
you don't really have that signature win either. And I'm not, <laughs> I know the committee is supposed to be really objective looking at these numbers, but it's hard to believe that if Iowa is on national TV beating some of these really good teams that are ranked in, in these ranked matchups, that the committee is not, that, that that's not going to have sort of an outsized influence, that, that that's not going to be in people's minds. And it, I mean, they all count the same in quad one, but that, that would be, I think, a big factor if they can get some of those wins. Yeah, I mean, the Big Ten is just so, uh, you know, sometimes a lot of years I just roll my eyes at the propaganda from the Big Ten and it's fans and its coaches about this is the best league in the country. And it's like, yeah, okay. And uh, when's that last national champion you've had? But this year, it's just, if it's by default, if nothing else. I mean, Michigan, Illinois, Ohio State are all in the top five of the AP poll. They're all in the top six of the, the net. Uh, you just can't deny it. The ACC just doesn't have it this year. The, the Big 12 just doesn't have it this year. The Pac-12 doesn't. The SEC doesn't. The Big 10 owns college basketball outside of the fact it doesn't have either of the two most dominant teams. Yeah, and that usually the argument for the Big 10 is the depth because you're looking at possibly 10 to 11 NCAA tournament teams in certain years. And this year you pair that depth with elite teams. And the downside is that Gonzaga and Baylor have sort of separated themselves, but I think Michigan could be close to that conversation. And then like you said, you've got Ohio State, Illinois, all these teams that aren't just tournament teams. They're not just ranked teams. They're one seeds and two seeds. And the Big Ten, it, to me, is clearly the best conference this year. And, you know, I got all the respect in the world for Gonzaga and Baylor. I mean, they're just really, really good. Mm. But if they were playing a Big Ten schedule, they wouldn't be unbeaten right now. I, I tend to agree. I, I mean, Gonzaga – put together a non-conference schedule that was similar to what you would be facing in a power conference day to day, but that was only over a few weeks. I mean, this is over a few months playing elite teams almost every night, not counting Nebraska. And I, I, it, it's just hard to go undefeated against that. No matter how good you are, you're just going to, you're going to slip up one night. I'm not saying that they wouldn't still be, the most impressive teams, but yeah, you're going to slip up here or there. Um, Joe Wieskamp was the Big Ten Player of the Week this week. I, I wasn't sure he would be with what Dasunmu did at Nebraska to pull that game out of the fire. And then again, last night against Northwestern, he kind of kept Northwestern at bay late in the game, but but Wieskamp, I mean, I thought fully deserved it with the way he played against Rutgers and Michigan State. He's, you know, he, over his last four games, he's averaging over 20 points, eight and a half rebounds. And uh, Garza is at 16 and uh, 6.8 over the, the last four games. Wieskamp, beyond that, is just shooting absurdly well. I mean, he's, he's over 60% from three-point over his last nine games. Uh, last week, or in the two games that got him the player of the week, he was 10 out of 14. That's not being in a zone. That's being unconscious. It's too late for him to be a first-team All-Big Ten player because there's just too much competition, and this, his season numbers aren't comparable to guys like Marcus Carr and, you know, other players. And the league is stacked with all league players. I mean, Travion Williams is fantastic. And Trace Jackson Davis is fantastic. And EJ Liddell's fantastic. On and on and on. But over the last several games, I say this is a first team all Big Ten player. How about yourself? I agree. And does Wieskamp realize that he's uh, letting Desumu into this play closer to the player of the year conversation? I mean, he's, he's stealing yeah. all the numbers from Garza. He's going to limit his limit his resume a little bit but yeah he's he's been outstanding and he's just one of those guys where his he's so quiet and smooth about with the way he goes about 
things where when you look at a guy like Garza and just how hard he has to work, it's, it seems when you're just watching it, it seems how hard he has to work to get points, to get rebounds. Just with Wieskamp, it's kind of the opposite. It's just so fluid and smooth. And that just goes from his, from his jump shot to the way he can out jump people to get rebounds, the way he just solidly defends and, and he's just not a loud person in general, just not really an emotional person. So sometimes you can forget just like how, how amazing he is the, over these last couple of weeks, because you kind of are at the point where you just expect when he gets an open look that it's going to go in no matter how far away it is, no matter how little time he has. And it's, it's just been incredible to watch him because we've seen this in stretches over his career where he'll have, and even a couple of weeks ago at Indiana when he has just an outstanding half, but then, you know, the defense locks in on him a little more and he, he just quiets down for a few minutes. And over these last couple of games, he's just been hunting the whole time and it's come at exactly the right time for Iowa and it's just what they needed. Yeah. I, th- I think it's, it's no more complicated than the, than the maturation of a major talent. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's like, it's, it's much what you said, but uh, I think that there's something inside him just said, be a little more assertive. Uh, try to, you know, try to take over games at times. Uh, shoot the ball. I mean, he's put up seven threes in each of the last two games. That's not a, a crazy amount, but uh, he's taking these shots at important moments in games. The last couple of games, I felt uh, those important moments were sort of not that plentiful against Michigan State once Iowa built the lead, but uh, he was the even amidst McCaffrey and Murray hitting the shots, Wieskamp seemed to be the guy that put the team on its shoulders and away they went. And then it was everybody's party from that point on. Uh, this is a, this guy came into Iowa with a lot. I, I don't know if you'd say a lot of hype, but he scored so many points at Muscatine. And then he comes to Iowa and you're thinking, well, this is, you know, a whirlwind of an offensive player. And no, this was a team player. He, he just hadn't had, teammates before i mean at muscatine it was joe Wieskamp and and pray for rain i mean he was their team and i don't mean to insult their other players but 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 that that team wins maybe two or three games without him and suddenly he's surrounded by big 10 caliber players and he still averaged 11 points as a freshman and shot 40 some percent from three point and he averaged 14 points last year He's been, I mean, he he had all Big Ten honors last year, uh, second or third team. But this year has been when Joe Wieskamp, I think, has become Joe Wieskamp, especially in 2021. And this is another reason why I think Iowa is a team to be feared in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, he's still shooting. 49% 49% from three point range over the season, which is just, like, oh, yeah. it's that's, crazy. That's me. Hey, let's start shooting even more, I think. And 50% in big 10 play. And I think that the element of his game that he, that is even getting better is just how aggressive he is going to the basket. I think there's still times when, when he, when he drives that he kind of, I think he knows what he's doing, but he, he, he just gets caught up sometimes and, and loses the ball. That's kind of the, the one part of his game where maybe he's looked to get even better. Obviously, his, his shooting is, is so much better this year. But I think if he can get into the lane and get to the free throw line, that makes him an even more complete player. And he kind of – it's it, the stretch is kind of reminding me of – a guy like Jared Utoff and even Matt Gaines a little bit where you could always see the talent was there and you were just waiting for them to take over and just mm-hmm. be a, be a leader and demand the ball and, and show off what they can do on offense, not be afraid to make mistakes. And I think we're seeing that from Wieskamp over the last few weeks. He, he, 
he knew, he knows he's one of the best players in the conference, and he and he's proving it. Mm-hmm. Well, we're recording this on Wednesday morning. The Iowa Wisconsin games Thursday night. What surprised me uh, about as much as Iowa's blowout margin against Michigan State was the next day when Wisconsin lost at home to Michigan. And I know that sounds strange since Michigan leads the Big Ten and is number three in the country, et cetera. But Michigan hadn't played in 23 days, and they resumed the season by going to Wisconsin. And I thought Michigan's going to go splat in that game. It would have been understandable. And they were splat for a while. They were down by 12 points at halftime and as much as 14. But then Michigan clamps on the defense. The Badgers get two baskets in like the final 11 minutes. Michigan wins by eight. And Wisconsin looks like it just got walloped emotionally to me, you know. And if you remember, they had preseason title hopes that were about as high as Iowa. And with good reason, they shared the Big Ten title last year with Maryland and Michigan State, and they returned everybody who mattered. They've got six seniors in their rotation. Uh, Demetri Trice is their money guy, the point guard, their leading scorer. He's a fifth-year senior. So you're thinking this, along with Illinois, is going to be what Iowa's got to get past instead of Michigan and Ohio State. But Wisconsin's 5-5 five and five over its last 10 games, and it's not repeating as champions. It's a vulnerable team, or is it really? In a lot of ways, it reminds me of the game at, in the, the game at Carver last year when Wisconsin came in really on the – really in the midst of struggling a lot. And – not really having a, an identity, the typical Wisconsin basketball identity that you would expect. I think that's right around the time when Kobe King had left the team and had decided he was going to transfer. And right, bef- right before Wisconsin started to go on that winning streak and be able to win the Big Ten, I watched that game against Michigan. And for them to be, they were outscored 40 to 20 in the second half. And Potter and Reavers, their two big guys, didn't have a single rebound. And that's just not the Wisconsin basketball you would expect. Um, it was just weird to see a team that brought back everybody, added a, a high caliber of freshman in Jonathan Davis and seemed a little lost at times. Um, Aline Ford shot the ball really well in the first half, but overall he's only shooting 34% from three this year. Potter is their second leading scorer and he just got benched, pulled out of the starting lineup. He's, he has been he, for for a guy who has such a good looking stroke. He has been not good at all from from three point range, and you almost wonder if he needs to just focus on scoring inside because he's shooting thirty three percent from deep. It's just a team that has gone through stretches where they just have struggled to score, and it's led to some really questionable losses. That they lost to Penn State. That obviously they got blown out badly by Michigan. It's no. It's not a bad thing to lose to Michigan, but they got just hammered the first time that they played. It's a team that, like you said, had had the same expectations similar to Iowa and Illinois. And for as disappointed as Iowa fans were that they had slipped up a couple of times over the last few weeks, I think Wisconsin fans are probably even more disappointed with all that they brought back and to just not be able to put together a winning streak. It was, it's like, they win a game, but then they, they lose. They, and then they, you think that they're back and then they, they lose to a Penn state. And it's just a team with some question marks right now and seems to be lost at times. And so it's, it's a game that Iowa can win for sure. Well, in hindsight, I'm wondering if maybe they weren't the great overachievers last season. I look at their roster and I don't see big 10 title material and they obviously haven't played like it. They're not a great rebounding team. Uh, They haven't been able to control the paint. They're not a great three-point shooting team, not at all. In fact, they've been very bad at it the last few games. And you uh, you mentioned Reavers. I thought he was going to be one of the better players in the conference this year. He's down four points a game from last season. And and to me, I hate to say these things about individuals, but he, he just isn't what I expected. 
Uh, you know, I think they're, they're, they're just, they're good, but they're not special. Uh, they've gotten beat four times by double digits in the big 10. They lost at Penn state by 10 points. Uh, you compare that to Iowa and yeah, I was lost five big 10 games, but there hasn't been a one-sided loss. Uh, really? I mean, they lost by 12 to Indiana, but, the, but that score was kind of misleading. Uh, unless I'm forgetting one that I've blotted out. But that said, you rule nothing out going into this game because you know what you're getting when you go to Wisconsin. You're getting veteran players who take care of the ball. They defend. They usually play at their pace, not yours. Mm. And it's the same old Wisconsin in that it's a team that I don't care to watch, but it's dangerous. And I was got to pass them by if they're going to get into the, uh, you know, set themselves up for what we talked about earlier with a top four finish and seating purposes and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It was a struggle last year in that game at, at Carver that I mentioned low scoring and it took a, it took a second half comeback for Iowa to win that. And yeah, I mean, I th- I think you're right. I think Wisconsin was a little bit overhyped coming into the season just because they had won the big 10 last year, but they did it with, they tied it and they did it with six losses. And I remember thinking last year, as we were talking about earlier, how the big 10 propaganda kind of year over year, we go through this. It's like all last year, it was like the big 10, the death is like the best in the league, but really like their best teams were like Maryland wasn't really thought of as like a final four contender. And I remember thinking if Wisconsin wins your conference, that Wisconsin that we saw last year, how, how good really is it? And I think we just kind of, I think people just kind of expected Wisconsin to take a little bit of a leap, just bringing everybody back and being a solid team last year. And it it just looks like a, it just looks about the same as last year. I mean, they have some gritty players. They, like you said, they defend well, but it's, it's not, I think it's, it's not in the same tier as like an Illinois or an Ohio state. And so, yeah, it's obviously going to be a tough game, but it is one that you have to win if you want to get where you want to be. Well, I'm going to pick Iowa just because I think it's two teams going in the opposite directions and because there's no coal center crowd. And I, I just think that Iowa um, can overcome the pace and can stretch out the defense enough to get out of there with maybe a – Four or five point win. What do you think? I think Iowa wins. I I would even say that it might be by eight to ten points. And I think I think Garza is going to have a monster performance. I think he's going to be able to to get about what he wants inside. You know, it's it's going to be tough. They're going to send double teams at him, and they have some. They do have some solid big guys, but it's. I think Garza is going to be stewing in this one and he's going to come out firing. And I, I think he'll lead Iowa to a, a tough, but somewhat comfortable win. You know, he, all the talk from him is I came to win, not score points, came back to win, not score points. But you can't tell me that uh, an eight point game is not gnawing at him a little bit, even at, though they won by 30, that, there aren't going to be any more of those. Especially if, when you're playing a team like Michigan State that doesn't have the 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 hot the the best posts in the conference, and you're thinking, and you look at that defense, and he you just got to be licking your lips. And for him to walk out of there with eight points, he's like, I gotta, because you see when he come when like, like against Indiana and against Ohio State, some guys were some teams that had those all conference forwards. He comes out and is just like ready to show that he's the best. And I think it's, I think you're going to see that against Wisconsin. Well, speaking of Garza needs 43 points to tie Roy Marble and become Iowa's all time leading scorer. And it could very well happen before the weekend's over. I mean, if he, if he scores his season average, he will break the record Sunday. Uh, a question I'm asking is is he all is he Iowa's all time best player? And I know how subjective these things are, 
And uh, the, the correct thing to do might be to say, ask again in March. Ronnie Lester's the popular answer. And with good reason. He, he steered Iowa to a Big Ten title in 1979. They haven't had one since. His presence carried them to a Final Four in 1980, although it was a great team effort. Uh, he's the guy I'd pick. I, I wouldn't pick Roy Marble, who is the all-time leading scorer. But Marble was on an Elite Eight team, followed by a Sweet 16 team the, uh, the year after that. And that's something that Garza and, and his teammates have yet to do. But I'm going to say Garza replaces Lester. And I'll give my reasons, but first I'm going to ask you for yours. Well, it's, it's a little tougher for me because I wasn't around during those days to see those guys and, and sort of experience that on a, on a night-to-night basis. Um, just from what I've read and what I've understood about the, the history, it, it seems to me like Ronnie Lester is the best overall talent, just the way that fans talk about that, that year that they could have won the national title had he not gotten hurt, that they seemed in position to do that. Then you talk about winning the Big Ten. Then you look at a guy like Roy Marble as like as the all-time leading scorer, and he was on some outstanding teams too. I did my my dad actually recorded some of those NCAA tournament games on VHS, so that mm-hmm. that's how I spent a lot of my days when I was homesick from school. I was watching the uh, '87 NCAA tournament, so that was fun. But I think you can kind of look at it a couple different ways. You can look at it as the most talented player that made the the biggest impact at Iowa, just who was just so good that it was like you couldn't miss watching them play and who was putting up points on just a consistent night to night basis. And then you can look at sort of the legacy question. And I think when you look at the NCAA tournament runs of the other guys, and like you said, with the, the last big 10 title with Lester that sticks out so much, that makes a big impact. And Garza really hasn't had a chance to do that as much. Now, I think the national player of the year conversation that helps him a lot, just, you know, getting second in that last year and possibly going to win it this year, but he, but he hasn't been able to have sort of those, the memories that you're going to think about 20, 30, you know, 30, 40 years when we're talking about the next great Iowa player. And he still has the chance to do that. And I'm not saying that people are going to forget him far from it, but mm-hmm. it's, it's going to be, I, I think he might, I, I would say he's probably the best player that they've had, but in terms of like, if you're doing one of those, just ranking who had, who leaves the, the biggest legacy, who, when you think of Iowa basketball, who do you think of? I think he, he if if he can have some high impact moments in March, I think that would put him over the top too. It's kind of like the argument you have in sports. Should there be an MVP and then should there also be a player of the year? Yeah. Uh, the thing that, to remember, and I know that you were including this in what you just said, is Garza didn't have a chance in the NCAA tournament last year. Mm-hmm. And that team firmly believes it would have caused some serious damage in the tournament. And I think it's well within the realm of possibility, but we'll never know. This, this year is his chance. Uh, and this is it. Unless I can persuade him to come back next year. <laughs> <laughs> Seems unlikely, <laughs> but, but, but uh, then you got to step back and realize this is going to be a consensus two-time first-team All-American. I was never had one of those. There have been darn few in the Big Ten. He'll probably be a two-time Big Ten player of the year. I was never had one of those. There have been very few, if any, that I know of. I mean, I'm sure Glenn Robinson was, but I can't off the top of my head think of too many others. And he's probably going to be the national player of the year. Uh, Name any one of those three things. You know, and right there, you've got to say, I think that's the guy. 
Mm. He's probably going to be all three. Uh, the biggest question to me is if if uh, he's a surefire Big Ten Player of the Year with the way Desumu is getting. I mean, Desumu is winning games in the last few minutes. It seems like every night. The thing is, he's, I mean, last night against Northwestern, he was, he was silent. He had five points going into the last few minutes, but he ends up with 13 and makes three killer shots. And so the legend of DeSumo grows, even though he only had 13 points at home against Northwestern. But they go to Nebraska, and the team plays a lousy game, gets pushed to overtime, was fortunate to get into overtime. He got them into the overtime. And then he torches them in overtime. And these are moments in which, on top of his 20 points a game and his assists, it's like, oh, you know, Illinois sitting there higher in the standings than Iowa. And this guy's got a reputation that's about impeccable. And for neutral voters, they've, this isn't a, uh, forgive the pun, a slam dunk. No, I don't think so. And and Desumo makes those winning plays. He makes as cliche it is, at cliche as it is, those Heisman moments. If you're talking about a, a football term, and he's not just like piling up points and and having a high field goal percentage. Now, I, Garza obviously contributes hugely to Iowa's winning, but I think if Iowa loses like four out of the next five. And Garza is still pretty good, but Dosumu takes Illinois towards the top of the Big Ten. Then you could, I think it's going to be a lot closer than what we maybe realized even just a couple of weeks ago. And right now, I would say the narrative is still just so strong in Garza's favor. And part of that is because he came in as the preseason national player of the year. So how can you say he's not even the best in the Big Ten? But yeah, if Iowa did slip up here in the next few weeks and Illinois was clearly one of the best teams in the Big Ten, pushing right around that two seed, maybe even close to a one seed line, and Dosumu is the guy that's taking them there, then there's going to be more of a conversation than we probably realized. To me, it's kind of like Gonzaga Baylor one and two. Mm. I think Gonzaga is number one because it was number one, or it was higher ranked coming in. Mm. And nobody's proven that Gonzaga shouldn't be number one. So Gonzaga is going to be number one. And I think that's the same way with Garza. Garza came in as the preseason player of the year, has done nothing to diminish himself, has only enhanced that. And so it's going to take, I was going to have to fall down for Garza not to be the Big Ten and National Player of the Year because he's ingrained in everyone's minds. Uh, were they both starting from scratch this year, I I don't know, you know. I mean, what what Desumu's done and in, in helping Illinois to what what are they ten and three in the conference, eleven and three? I'd have to look. I, I should have these things memorized. But they've only lost three, right? Is that wrong? They they have lost three. That's correct. Yeah, they're eleven and three. Eleven and three. Eleven and three and nine and five. You know. And uh, if, if Illinois still plays Michigan, and Michigan's got other tough games, so, you know, if Illinois shares the Big Ten title, that's going to be an interesting vote, a tough vote. But in the meantime, Garza's got for sure eight games left, and one would think more than that. Uh, he's going to tack on at least another 200 points. Uh, so you're talking about a guy who's going to have 2,300 points, 2,350. That record could stand for eternity at Iowa. I mean, marbles has lasted 32 years. You just don't have players like that who play four years in college, who score those kind of points. So Garza's name is going to be there for decades and decades at Iowa. So I don't think that this is a guy who's going to be very easily forgotten. No, I mean, he, it's like I said, right now you think of Iowa basketball and, and Luca Garza is the guy that's going to 
start popping to mind more and more for, for just general college basketball fans. And that does play a role. And I think that player of the year conversation, just who, who's on, who do you think of when you think of who's making the most impact, who is the best player and you see, and when you're going to see him break the record for most for the uh, career scoring leader, and you just thinking of him as a college basketball legend and, that's a that's a Big Ten Player of the Year, if you ask me. Yeah, everybody in America who follows college basketball knows who Luca Garza is. Mm-hmm. There haven't been very many Iowa players in the last few decades you could say that about. You know, there aren't that. I mean, in the course of a year, there are only a handful of players you can say that about. I believe. I mean, I can't name you. I'm. I'm a casual fan when it's outside the conferences that I cover. I don't, I watch big 10 uh, pack 12 games for Bill Walton and Bill Walton only <laughs> conference of champions. Yeah. I can't name you players around the ACC and SEC this year. I just don't watch it. Uh, they don't to me have the dynamic teams this year. I can tell you Gonzaga is because I've seen Gonzaga play, but also because they are number one in the country. But I can tell you that Luca Garza is known in all four corners of the country and every place in between. And that just doesn't happen from an Iowa player. John Licklider, maybe the. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, God. <no. laughs> <laughs> that, that's your limitation. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're right, though. I mean, you look at Gonzaga and Baylor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Funny enough, I was just thinking about him the other day because I was trying to remember who Iowa's best, like, pure three-point shooters are. And <laughs> say what you will about that guy. He could he could hit a three-point shot. But, um, I mean, you look at, you look at Gonzaga and Baylor, and they, they, they have national player of the year capable players, but they have so many. They, they've got – they each have, like, two to four – potential that could be all Americans if they were getting the same usage that a guy like Garza is and Garza takes Iowa from a a good team to potentially elite team and that that makes a big difference too well when next we meet we'll know if Iowa survived Madison and we think that they'll come home and beat Penn State Uh, but we know one thing that, that the narrative will change again as it does every week so Look forward to talking to you about that and some very interesting games ahead. That's what makes it fun. We got something new to talk about all the time, and it's a uh, good one week. Could be not so good the next, but it'll be fun to watch. All right. Well, thank you. And thanks to everybody for dialing this up, as they used to say, watching, <laughs> listening, streaming. And, um, uh, Come back next week.